Welcome to the podcast, Food Talks. I'm Dallas Townsend. I will be your host. And I act as the uninformed consumer asking a nutritionist all the questions that you have. Hello, I'm Jordan Townsend. I'm our resident nutritionist here at Naturally You, and I'm here to inform the uninformed consumer, answering and helping to unpack some of your more difficult nutrition questions. Alrighty, everybody. Welcome back. On this week, we're going to go ahead and finish up the Q&A part that we started last week. We still have about 15 questions roughly left, Kelsey. We have a good bit, and I'm so excited to get back on here um, to do the next set of questions with everyone. So, yeah. So, yeah, similar as last time, we're going to kind of just go through these. We, we have them sort of broken up into groups, for, for lack of a better word for it. Uh, but from there, we're going to kind of just try to expand on them and go into as much depth as we possibly can. And again, we're going to hopefully, because I, I think we had a pretty good turnout this time, maybe in another six months or so, we'll do another Q&A type episode like this. Because again, that's what this podcast is for. Just answer y'all's questions. So whatever y'all want to know is what I want to talk about. So where did you want to start today, Miss Kelsey? So let's start. And also, if you got more questions, we know a lot of people didn't get their questions in. And so if you got more questions, that'll be a perfect time we can do part three. And so we're going to start off with just the basic things about us as well. A client wants to know how often should they be tested using what we do here in our team? Is it daily, weekly, monthly, yearly? Like, what does that look like for our average client here at Naturally You? So yeah, the the main thing we're trying to do usually is we want to, again, we want to test you a lot at first. So when you initially come in as a client, the main reason we're testing you way more often in the beginning is because we're trying to dig through these layers and address them, the organs and things, as, as quickly as possible. So generally when people first come in, we see them every week, maybe every two weeks, but long term especially if you've been a client over six months, more time between testing you and checking you is better because we want to give that nutrition and more importantly the changes in diet and stuff that you've made time to actually sort of sink in and take hold. Now, should something come up acutely, you can always call us and come in and get checked immediately right then for that issue. But eventually, at least probably every month at the most often, and then ideally every three to four months after that that's of course once you get into what we would consider maintenance you know you you've got your diet dialed in pretty good you've got these organs and things supported and built back up using the nutrition the body should be able to maintain itself it should be able to keep this status quo this this equilibrium if you will so that it's working now should you change something should you eat a food should you get exposed to chemicals should something happen question, or yeah. even get sick right that's when we want to more test you is more in that acute stage but long term more time between testings is better that's what i always found the more time i give your body to actually let something change that's when i want to actually look into and how it. often does it take for all that change to happen like how many so for us we usually change? say the, the baseline is 90 to 120 okay. days now that's not from necessarily even the visit to visit at first but that's for the full cell cycle to take place and that's red blood cell cycle we're using there specifically uh so yeah that's why ultimately even testing you at first every two or three weeks that's still not even a drop in the bucket as far as the full 90 to 120 days goes so that's why i say long term especially more time between them is better and that's why that's how we actually end up scheduling and staggering our program here is eventually i don't want to see <laughs> if i can if, <laughs> if i can help it right because if you're feeling good and you're at the weight you want to be and you're not having headaches and you're not dealing with all these issues anymore go be well that's why i say we're kind, of, we're kind of different than the doctor in that sense of once you get better once i teach you how to fish go fish i don't want you to have to stay keep coming back to see me every single time something crazy goes on or happens so that makes sense and that goes with another segue with that so once we get to that kind of stage where we don't have to come as often another client had a perfect question i will go with this what are the common like essential supplements to keep on hand for like headaches or like muscle pain like just kind of allergy just like so, in between well this is why it gets tricky because some of those things can be very extremely varied like headaches right i've seen headaches caused from everything from chemicals food fungus so that's a little bit of a trickier one now there are some things like uh, supplements like cataplex e2 
which is more of a vasodilator, that can help with the symptom side of a headache, but it may not be why you got the headache to begin with. Same thing, we have a supplement called Turmeric Forte. It's a turmeric mixed with some other different stuff, but that one helps downregulate inflammation, which can help with pain. But okay. that's the two, I always joke, the two hardest things for nutrition to help deal with is pain and sleep. Those are just two that are very tricky to actually get dealt with because there's not an anti-pain supplement. There's not, a, there's not a nutritional or herb that blocks your body from receiving pain signals, kind of how Advil and opiates work. Whereas same with sleep, there can be a lot of, sleep is such a multi-mechanism action for humans that it's very rarely is, oh, you just take this and you'll start sleeping. Well, no, there could be a lack of melatonin production. There could be other hormonal issues preventing your body from making enough of that. Mm -hmm. It could also just be stress in general, which is more hormone stuff keeping you from sleeping. So as far as any of those things go, we would always want to test you. I would want to just see, because again, even for headaches, right? Even for, let's just say congestion. Well, I normally, or even allergies, right? I would say, you know, we have two supplements, Antronex and Aller, Allerplex. Those are usually good things for that, but we have a bunch of stuff for drainage. We have a bunch of stuff for uh, allergy type responses, hives, or any of that type of stuff. So that's where we actually come in and the rubber meets the road. I would want to just see of all the stuff I sell, which one do you actually need? Because remember, I can make more money just selling you random bottles. Mm -hmm. That's what your doctor already does. That's why people come to us instead of a doctor, though, is they want more specific to their body individually. What is, what are they, what is their body asking for? There's no guesswork in this whole thing so, that we do here. And that's all I would want to say is, yeah, I can say if you have this in your pantry, try it. But don't be surprised if it works half the time and it doesn't work half the time. Whereas if you come in and your body says, hey, I'm looking for Muplex specifically and garlic specifically, it knocks that stuff out a lot quicker. So I hope that kind of answers that makes, what you were saying. That that really does um, answer a lot. And so going back to more of what we do here at Naturally You, when we when you are using like NRT, a lot of clients... And just that nutrition response testing, yes. just, just for people who might not know. Yes, sorry about that. No, you're good. Um, we have clients who do come and still get confused on like what is blocked me and what is switching me. So, so you're just more wondering about yes, those can terms. You, yes, can you explain that to us? Well, those are trade secrets, Kelsey. You know, I can't be guided. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what she's talking about is the main thing we do is we do like a, a form of reflexology with the different organ systems, right? We go and test against lungs. We test against hearts, kidneys, and all that. But what she's referring to are what we call our two macro levels. The first one being blocked and the first and the second one being switched. Now the interesting thing to me about block and switch is we didn't come up with those terms. Also, Eulin Nutritional Systems where we learned all this stuff, they didn't come up with them. There's a there's a test called a heart rate variability. And these are actually getting more common. And have you have you heard of these whoop whoop strap bands and I've things? heard of those kind of bands. Whoop yeah. is just one of them, but they're they're basically a Fitbit type company whereas there it's a wearable thing but they actually have heart rate variability built into theirs so theirs actually measures your heart rate variability while you're sleeping and stuff oh that's cool and the reason they have been the original reason a heart rate variability test was invented was sort of a form of physical fitness now this is the story that i was told i can't validate it 100 percent, but it was actually invented in in cold war russia because over there what they would do is let's say you have 10 people that you want to be runners well, if you give them all a heart rate variability, it will sort of it will show you essentially how adaptable that body is. So, if I'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars on each of these people, and I do a heart rate variability on them, it can tell me, hey, these five have a lower adaptability. Their ability to recover, their their peak physical fitness is not going to even be as high as these other five. So if you're looking as far as a resource thing, you can almost double your efficiency by cutting out those five people who, instead of spending 12 years on training them, nutrition, all this stuff, let's just focus on the five who not only have the same physical attributes, but their ability to adapt, and more importantly, their ability to overcome and improve in these to stressful heal. things. Okay. Yeah, more important, or again, how adaptable are they? Because again, if you overload some people, they, they get injuries. You know, they, they're going to, that's, that's what it's kind of using to predict is, hey, how much more likely to getting hurt, to getting injured? What is, what is the peak this person can reach? Well, this person's peak is only 75%. Well, this person's peak is 95. So let's take him because we got another 20% peak performance we can reach with this person just based on how their body is reacting. 
and it does that by marrying by measuring the variables in your heart rate that's why when we do our heart rate variability half of it is supine laying down relaxing half of it's upstanding and it measures the difference in the changes in that that's why it's called heart rate variability the changes of that heart rate depending on what you're doing and where and what you and where you're at so that's what's kind of interesting about it more than anything is it also a lot of it takes into sleep into account and a lot of other different stuff. So that was what they were using it for was, hey, let's not waste $500,000 training these five people when their ceiling is only 65%. Let's focus on these five who all have over a 90% chance of being the best in their sport specifically. Wow, I work here and I didn't even know like that detailed part of it. But it's really, exactly. it's really neat to know where, the it, came back, where it came from, the background of it. Because now it puts everything in perspective here when... People do get their hearts out on cores and things like that. Well, and, it, and they're still using it in super elite athletes that way too. Like a lot of times too, is they'll they can actually tailor workout and specific things for Olympic athletes, pro athletes, based on what their heart rate variability says. Because if you have a low adaptability that day, hey, well, well, this needs to be a light day. Like I don't know if he didn't sleep well last night. I don't know if he's stressed out by something else. Or maybe he just didn't get the right nutrition, didn't wasn't able to recover as much. I need that machine every day when I plan my work. No, so seriously. So instead of trying to push you hard because it's Tuesday, let's do a lighter day today. Will we do the HRV tomorrow? Oh, well, hey, you're back over 90% again. Hey, but time to go back hard again. It's a way to just train more efficiently instead of trying to just everyone does this exact same routine no matter what. So we use it in a similar way. The way we use it to us, we just establish a baseline with basically how hard is your body working. That's what we use it for. What is your stress level as a just average American person? That's why some people come in, they got great HRV scores. Well, I talk to them, sure enough, they exercise, they teach a class, they've been running marathons, they're swimming, they're eating right, they're doing all this other stuff. Some people come in and theirs is in the tank and they go, I don't do anything. My, both of my parents died of heart attacks in their 50s. I got diabetes and cancer all through my family. Okay, well, this kind of makes sense. That's what's kind of mm -hmm. nice is it is all subjective, but it's nice to see physically kind of you. It's telling you where people's adaptability is, are. Is this person going to be able to even be an elite athlete based on their physiology? That's what's kind of crazy about it to me versus, and you've seen it. Some people come in and they surprise you. Like, I go, look, man, either you're doing something right or you've got great genetics. Yeah, I've heard you say that. Those are the two things. If you got a good, great, good HRV score and you're not actively trying you just come from good stock. So it can always be that too. Some people just are more predisposed to be higher performers. That's genetics, right? Some people are just going to have to work harder. That's just genetics. So that's what we're using that machine for. Now, I say all of that to simply tell you there are two different levels on that HRV machine. One of the terms they use is called switch. One of the terms they use is called blocks. That's what's interesting to us about block and switch. I, I didn't even come up with that. That's just something that machine is specifically picking up on. And I always joke that I'd be block, switch, flip, dip, and all the while. <laughs> now, <laughs> what those mean as far as we're concerned is blocked is our first level. Block means there's something physically stopping that nervous system from either communicating or regulating like it's supposed to. So that's why we also do our test in two levels. We have the sympathetic nervous system, which is me and you talking right now. That's mm -hmm. your up and active you're responding to what's happening in your environment and giving back out. Now, the other side of that page is the PSNS, or parasympathetic nervous system. That's your eyes closed, laying down, relaxing. Body's not really worried about what's happening around outside of it. It's worried about what's going on internally. We would call that healing mode is another term for it. Okay. So again, part of why you sleep. Hey, let's actually fix some of this stuff instead of just, you know, pushing, seeing acquiring calories. I think of Moses Jones when I think of like everything coming out at night to heal and oh, yeah. moving and work and like that's like a cool sort of movie to kind of You're actually funny. Things. I just it's on like net actually I think it's on HBO. I actually I just so. watched that recently. What? It came out in two thousand and two. So I remember I was a fifth grader when Osmosis Jones I came out. I love that I used movie. to love that movie so much. Cause I thought it was so cool because I remember thinking like, is this what my body looks like <laughs> on the inside? And yes and no, right? Yeah. Yes to some degree. Not, of course, not, there's no drama, right? You know, <laughs> that cells don't have their own personality. But, yeah, it's an entire, to say a city is an understatement. Because there's about a trillion, about 10 trillion cells in your body. Wow. So, yeah, it's basically its own planet, for lack of a better term. All working together, which makes it even stranger. So, exactly. Block means stuck. So, 
when we, you're blocked on one of our tests, all it's telling me is there's something macro affecting multiple organ systems. If you're blocked and it's stopping this entire sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system from, from talking like it's supposed to, your heart, your liver, your kidney, and your thyroid are all going to be affected by that, not just one individual organ system. Same goes for switch. Now, switch for us means confused. So instead of stuck, you're doing the opposite. So instead of sleeping at night, you're wide awake. Instead of being energetic during the day, you're dragging and tired. So the switch and block are basically just whatever this stressor is or whatever's going on, it's affecting multiple systems in the body. So instead of just your thyroid, everybody's upset by that food or that chemical or whatever. That makes so much sense. That's so cool because we do have a lot of people who um, kind of get confused or need us to repeat it again. So here you have it, folks. A detail, even some background history on what all this means and why we do it here and how we do it here. Going to another gear is, so what are the effects of food hormones to our bodies? And so I know that can be part of like some issues that we have and our boxes kind of have food hormones and well yeah well a lot of that too is still just if you really look into the science inconclusive you know but I, same thing i'll say with that too is they still say they still say on the packaging that smoking may cause cancer so it's one of those things that it's still kind of murky and un, un, unsure unproven mm -hmm. but let's just go back that's what I always try to do on this podcast is think about who we are and where we came from. The, the little bit of animal protein we were able to get our hands on thousands of years ago was going to be very, very lean, so not very high fat. Also, usually you're going to get juveniles or you're going to get older animals. You're not really going to be able to get the young stud buck, right? Mm -hmm. He's the young stud buck. He's at his peak, so he's more elusive. He's harder to get your hands on. I think the biggest problem we're seeing nowadays is the commercial raising of animals, right? So you can give a cow growth hormone to make it grow faster. Gotcha. So it becomes an economic thing, not as far as a health safety profile thing, not even really a nutrition thing. It's just the sooner I get this animal to a certain weight, especially since they pay based on weight, I can make more money. So that to me is where it gets kind of interesting. The thing that correlates with that directly is the increase in animal protein consumption that we see now. We eat meat, generally, every single meal, almost. Almost, I mean, yeah. Most, most Americans. I'm, again, I'm always talking about the baseline America, not the vegans, the vegetarians, not even meat and meat. You know, we're even trying a little bit harder. Like today, I'll eat a salad, maybe some chicken salad on it. Not really a lot. Just something. Yeah, maybe. maybe. And that's what I'm saying, truly, maybe. So I think it's a combination of we're giving these different animals different hormones. We're giving them, besides that, we're giving them antibiotics. We're giving them all kinds of different medications. We're putting stuff in their feed to make sure that the feed doesn't go sour and grow fungus. So it's weird. We're giving them all kinds of things. We don't really know even to forget the food hormones directly. Does, does feeding cows antifungals and antibiotics, does that affect their hormone level? It, oh, I didn't could, think about that. It actually could raise things like their cortisol. You know what I mean? It could make them more stressed, which could actually make them gain more fat, which could actually affect their hormones negatively. So you might have to end up supplementing things like testosterone. I don't know any of this. Remember, this is all speculation from Jordan here. Yeah. This is just me looking at what I understand and, and trying to put it together to some degree. Is it why it's best to kind of go organic where you know a lot of it's not? Well, just where they're not going to use anything artificial. Yeah. This pig was fed food now the food might be grain but it wasn't it wasn't any sort of uh we didn't add any other antibiotics we didn't add any growth hormone to the food that's why you just want to always get like little small chickens when you small, buy organic. small chickens you want or really grass-fed cows remember none of these animals are supposed to eat grain because grain is something you cultivate you know what i mean you got to plant giant fields of wheat and then harvest it no animals have that technique down yet. So to feed them just grain as a purely grain as a diet is also unnatural for them. So that's where I, I get back to the food hormone thing. There's a lot of other stuff besides directly giving these animals hormones that we're doing. So that's why I say it's still kind of inconclusive. My thing is, though, when you start to look at boys and girls nowadays, what's happening? We're seeing girls especially going into puberty sooner. We're seeing boys going yes. into puberty later. So a lot of that goes into things like phytoestrogens and things like soy is a big example. 
Now, again, the science isn't 100% there to just say that that is the problem, but we're now consuming a lot more of these things. Now, the interesting thing, too, is then, well, like I was saying, is natural wild animals are always very lean. They have very little fat on them. Grain-fed, in a pen, animals get very fat very easily. Well, most of the hormones, actually all the hormones, are fat-soluble, specifically testosterone and estrogen. So that could even be playing into it, too. Now we got these big, fatty animals that might even be holding on to higher levels of their hormones than we necessarily knew or that their wild counterparts ever did. So couple that, an unnatural animal that's been given synthetic versions of its own hormones and holds a higher level of fat and our increased consumption. So, as with all things that I've talked about on this podcast, it's very rarely one thing causing anything. It's a whole combination of things. It's the wow. And, it, that's blown my mind. It's I'm the like, that's and, a lot. as I call it. It's that you're doing this, and, and you're doing that, and you're doing this, and it's an increase in plastics, and it's an increase in meat consumption, and, 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 and. Oh, that's why we see girls going into puberty at nine. Wait, what? Yeah, well, wow. we're getting all the, a lot of plastics also mimic estrogen. So that's why, again, for girls, they end up going into puberty sooner. Boys are actually having a delayed puberty. More importantly, sperm counts are on an absolute free fall right now. Like the average male today has half of the sperm his grandfather did. But there was no plastic on the planet and when his grandfather did. To think about. More importantly, what does that look like in two or three more generations? That's the real thing. So, again, I know this was a food hormone thing. But that's what I say. There's so, so much... much playing into this. I would never blame food hormones by themselves. But to say that they're not doing anything is just as disingenuous as saying that they're doing everything. So again, that's why I say most of the time you're going to find that middle ground. And most importantly, it's a pillar. It's part of what's going on with this food. It's part of this whole big pie that we've got ourselves here in 2021. Makes so sense. I hope that yeah I'm saying I hope that kind of made sense on what you're asking. Yeah, that makes sense, and I'm going to segue into no, something please. else because you were talking about cortisol and how you know it can you know make them fat. So the stress I, hormone. Yes. So a client had a question. It's like, how do you keep your cortisol levels under control? And like, when you don't keep them under control, what is like what happens? Yeah. So can you move to a private island? Let's see what's in my bank account. <laughs> right, 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 yeah, can you, I was like, can you just offload your kids? Can you just get rid of your husband? Can you just fire your balls? You know what I'm saying? So, like, that's where we're in such a strange post-dystopian world right now. That like, Remember what stress was, Kelsey. The number one stress of, or really, the only source of chronic stress in humans was hunger for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Acute stress, you know, all the time. Like, hey, a tiger's chasing me. Well, remember, you either get away or you don't. <laughs> That's a very short-term stress. You're not going to deal with that long-term. So the real stress that we humans had to face was hunger. Always hungry, pretty now much 24-7. we got credit card bills. We got daycare. We got... Relationships. You know, we're married. You know, we're in a, we're in a job we hate. Our kids are in a school that's too expensive. Or you divorced. It, or, you know, it could be a all, whole... No, all of that, everything. yeah. Exactly. More important, you're still married and you should be divorced. You see how crazy it's getting? And yeah. that's the thing. You signed a mortgage. That's 30 years, Kelsey. Your whole life. But no, that's 30 years. It's not going away. So you wow. see how weird? Yeah. So now you got this weird, ethereal form of stress that has nothing to do with food. But the problem is the same ancient signals are being sent. Hey, your cortisol has been elevated for three months. So your body starts. That's what's weird about cortisol. Cortisol specifically, first thing it does is make you hungry. <laughs> Because if you find anything edible, eat it. Some people stress eat when they're... The flip happens, too. When you are when you have elevated cortisol levels, your body actually tries to store belly fat specifically. So it's trying to actually store things as fat and slow down your fat burning. So it's trying to do everything it can not it's to use your... It's working against you. Oh, my gosh. It thinks you're starving. So see how weird of a sentence Whoa. that was. It's not working against you. Cortisol is working as it's been instructed to for the past 12 millennia. Only in the last hundred years is this a problem. So that so you see, again, that's what's going on with us right now, a lot of the human condition. We're not built for this. <laughs> We're built to be hunters and gatherers who acquire calories and reproduce. That's it. That's where, that's where the buck ends. Now we've added 99,000 wow. new things as far as society and your clothes and your job and your stature 
all this weird Facebook, stuff. Facebook, Instagram. I mean, well, you got you got to have this, or you're not cool. If you're not traveling here, you're you're a loser. It's like, wait, whoa, what, 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 what? Right. So exactly, that's the problem. Is this meat computer was not built to handle all of these problems, especially not chronically. You know, you can look at something and want it, either get it or you don't, and you move on. Well, social media keeps it right in front of your face, 24/7, 365, every single day that you don't have it. You're reminded you don't have it. You're reminded you don't have it. You're reminded you don't have it. You're right. And then you don't know why you're stressed. Or you just... Really? Yeah. You don't I mean, you have no clues. <laughs> I think of the movie Ice Age. You know, have you ever seen I that? I love Ice Age. At least the first one. I've seen the first one. I've seen them. But it throws me back into that where, you know, you see the man. Like, all they were worried about was, like, the big saber-toothed tiger. Yeah, and we might or, get like, killed. Or getting an acorn, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> right, literally. Girl, you well, know, again, that's all they worry about. If I don't about. save this acorn, I might starve in the winter. Time. And I have a family. And that movie... As far as that, they were good. Fish, I mean, it was just simple, but, like, that was the only pure stress. Well, it's a lot, again, it's not easier, but it's simpler when your your stress is acquire calories, acquire clean water, acquire, acquire shelter, protect your family. And reproduce. So, yeah, that's, yeah that's, your, that's your little five main pillars of human existence, right? Now we don't have the right shirt. And we're self-conscious and anxious, you know, or that person is my friend and the, his family are going on this trip and they're doing this and they just bought this house. And it's like, you see what I'm saying? We've just mm -hmm. added all of this against the ands. We've added all this unnecessary stress. Well, our bodies, this is what's weird. Stress is not, we think of it as this ethereal thing, right, that you can't touch. But if I stab you, your body's going to make cortisol. That's stress. If you're cut, if you're injured, if you're hurt, stress. If you're exercising, stress. So oh. if you're not sleeping, stress. So again, the body, the problem with the body a lot of times is it doesn't have different stress hormones for different things. If you're under stress, I make cortisol. Oh my gosh, can you, I can imagine it's being stressed all the time. Yeah, you, and you're you, working you, out being stressed. I well, mean, you've seen some of our clients. Yeah, I see myself. It's just their jobs a lot of times <laughs> too, right? Or their family and their kids, these things you, and I, I, I reference those because I'm not telling you to quit your job. You can't get can't get rid of your kids. You, you shouldn't you shouldn't divorce your wife if you're happy or your husband. All I'm saying is though those things are playing into your health because this is what's weird. Just because it's this ethereal thing you can't put your hands on physically, your adrenals are making cortisol. Your body is then responding and changing the way you feel. It's changing the way you burn calories. It's changing your cravings based on this outside thing. So that's what's weird. I always joke, remember, stress is the sixth stressor. It's the one we can't test for, but it's wreaking just as much havoc as foods and chemicals and all that other stuff is, too. So that's where it gets even trickier. Because it is, is it also like, so then your organs get stressed, too, with Oh, they respond. They resp everybody responds. Heart rate. Okay, okay, that makes sense. More importantly, other organs. Because if you're stressed, think about if you're starving to death, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's thousands of years ago. You know what your body's not really worried about? Ovulation. Uh, she hasn't eaten in six months. I don't really care if she gets pregnant right so this now. This affects girls, period. Well, estrogen, yeah, yeah right. So okay. A lot of times, too. Perfect. Well, okay. even you probably know this. One of the main things that happens to girls with eating disorders and stuff is they'll stop cycling. That is true. But that's more okay. of a nutrition thing, too. But mm -hmm. also, same thing for men. If I haven't eaten in six months, my sperm count's going to drop. My body goes, look, testosterone is so far down our list right now. Actually, I'm putting all of my resources into cortisol. Same thing happens to us when we eat too much sugar. If you're eating all this sugar and carbs, your body goes, hey, all my energy and all my resources are going into insulin production because your body is an acute machine. Like I said earlier, if I stab you, Kelsey, the only thing your body cares about right now is there is a hole in the wall. It'll actually stop digestion. It'll actually freeze a lot of these other things, hormone production, all that will stop. Ladies. There's a hole in the wall. <laughs> if, we don't start, is if we don't start patching that hole, nothing else matters, right? So that that's so what's cool. weird, too, is we, as conscious humans, remember, we're the ones planning for the future. We're thinking down the road and saving and retirement and all that stuff. Your body goes, there's a hole in the wall. If you don't patch that hole, nothing else matters anyway. So that's what's weird. That's when you gotta, you got to remember, too. There's the conscious human you and there's the animal you. They're both in there making decisions. <laughs> so... You got balancing them together is what's actually tricky and kind of hard. So I'm going to bounce off of that. No, perfect. So then, because then clients have another question, which is perfect, that is all flowing right now. Like, what are some ways that, um, 
we here and actually you help with stress and like maybe some other factors. So I know the, I go to a therapist every week. Couldn't encourage that more. <laughs> and again, float tanks, right? Yes, floating is amazing. Therapy, floating, exercise, um, meditation, Deep breathing, maybe. yeah, just walking, getting in nature. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. Again, you can also take Xanax. You can also take all these crazy, powerful benzodiazepines. What we do, though, same thing, is we want to first identify what organ. Is it actually the adrenals or is it more the front brain? So that, that prefrontal cortex, that's your emotional processing center. That's where you're actually, that's where humans get their emotional center from. Remember, most animals don't have a large prefrontal cortex because they don't have this emotional depth that we do and this ability to deal with these problems like we do. So once we figure out which one, then we check things like different supplements. Valerian's one that we'll test on people. We even have supplements like Mintran and things like that, which are more mineral blends to help just chill the body out, down-regulate it. Because that's what I took. I can't get rid of your stress, but I can help in allow your body's adaptability to deal with stress to improve so that it rolls off your shoulder instead of being the thing that breaks you down mm -hmm. and causes the panic attack, as I would call it. Because again, think about what a panic attack is. Panic attack is literally your brain, because we forget the brain's an organ, right? You can have a heart attack. You know what I mean? Your liver can actually stop and fail. Your pancreas, your colon can actually physically stop doing their job. A panic attack is when the brain le reaches a, pit, a level of stress and overwhelm where it checks out. Whoa. Didn't even think of it. It literally goes, like that. good luck. I'm not going to, I'm not helping anymore. I'm going to take five, so you're going to be just frozen, holding your steering wheel in traffic and not moving. I'm going to take a second because I literally have to do a hard reset because I'm literally at my peak. So, again, it's just weird, right? Wow. Back that up, Jordan. Like, I don't even think of that. Like, we have heart attacks. But a panic attack is, like, the same thing, but it just affects the brain. Yeah. I, I just never put that together like that. It's weird. Because, we again, in mental health especially, we always try to, we try to separate completely. But the brain is an organ. It's like depression, anxiety. PTSD, OCD, all of it is coming out of this brain. Now, some of it is physical damage to the brain, traumatic brain injuries and stuff, obviously genetic things. Some people mm -hmm. are predisposed. Your brain was built different. So, yes, yeah, so that's why I say this is not to say that these things are uh, necessarily your fault, but a lot of the time, nutritionally, what have you been building your brain out of? Like, how much good essential fatty acid have you been eating growing up? Well, none. I'm trying to get my dad well, on ch sure children, especially that. No, that. How much fish are you eating at four? Uh, zero. Well, it turns out that's when you need the highest amount of DHA, probably in your entire life, is about four to fourteen, when all that brain is quadrupling in size. That's when we, as Americans, eat the least. We give them chicken nuggets and peanut butter and crackers. I don't know why he can't focus. I don't know why he seems to be uh, anxious all the time. It's like, yeah, his brain is exhibiting symptoms. That's why you always tell me, make sure you me always like eat fish and stay on a good. But that's a different way to look at mental health, right? Is your brain is missing something that it needs, so it's actually not working. Scary, right? Right. When you have these different symptoms, like whether it be anxiety or depression or any of these things, a lot of it simply comes from you're missing something. So if you don't have those constituents, the essential fatty acids, the minerals, the B vitamins, when a brain is missing those things, just like any organ that doesn't have those things, it misfunctions. So what you're interpreting as anxiety or depression, et cetera, can be the brain's lack of some sort of nutritional support or, or basically what it needs to do the job correctly. So again, that's just again a different way to look at some of these chronic things that we've dealt with. So what else do you got for me there, Kels? Since we're talking about that, you know, missing certain things, what are the signs that you are like, does the clients have? Like, what are you, like, when you're low on vitamin D or if you're low on some of your B vitamins, what does that look like? Um, you won't really, it just depends. They're all super specific. I mean, case in point for more than anything would be, uh, like, vitamin C, right? If you don't have enough vitamin C, you actually get what we call scurvy. It's when your gums start to bleed and all that stuff. The B vitamins, different ones, like, I mean, some of them you'll, like, start to have, like, sores and stuff show up. But you're going to be getting enough B vitamins not to go into disease state. Same thing with vitamin D. You're not really going to necessarily notice anything, maybe low energy, reduced immune function. That's actually a big one for vitamin D is if you start getting sick a lot. So a lot of times you're not going to ever really 
avoid a specific nut unless you're just eating literally two things. If you're eating just like cheese and bread every day. I had one family member. Um, he got really sick, really bad, and found out he was missing B vitamins. And I, that was I can't remember which one it was, but it kind of left him. Um, not moving as well like it really For real? yeah it kind of messed with his motor skills and things like that and it just wowed me that it could be something that simple yes b vitamins that could that did wreak, wreak havoc on him like that so yeah in the in the can the b vitamins are kind of your do everything vitamin they make up your brain they make up your heart they make up your they help your liver detox they make up your muscles they do everything wow so that's why they're kind of a weird one like I said because again are you low on folate or you're low on niacin those are going to be different B vitamins entirely so like I said there's not really ever necessarily a way to know you can get your blood tested and stuff like that but we'll check too and just see hey do you actually need any of these because very often people don't need B's D's D is the common one just because it comes from the Sun and we wake up before the Sun goes off we get dressed we drive in our car to our offices sit in our office until five then we drive home so where did you get sun wow, exposure i didn't even think about that well where'd you get sun exposure right like when, <laughs> when did you get your body's the thing your body needs to actually make vitamin d you didn't so it's not that's where a lot of this is just tough we've created this because you got to go back your body your body never expected you to be able to stay alive if you just stayed in the cave all day so that's why the whole vitamin d thing makes sense like I said look if you don't get up and go you're not going to be a viable human anyway. So we can, we'll can we'll tie our production of vitamin D to the sun because surely they're going to have to get outside. And again, that's why our skin colors are different, Kelsey. Much true. Your ancestors were way closer to the equator than mine. So your body, literally, the vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. So remember, the Bs and C and all those are water-soluble. So again, that's why you can get injections of vitamin Bs you'll simply pee them out. You can take as much vitamin C as you want, you can pee it out. The D vitamins are fat soluble, so they don't clear the same. So you can actually get what's called sun poisoning. Whoa! Yeah, they think that's actually overproduction of vitamin D. So your body and your genes actually developed a protective layer to, prevent, to keep you from overproducing vitamin D. Whereas when you go way up to those Nordic countries, Vikings, Norway, Ireland, people almost look translucent, don't they? Yes, they do. That's their body is so desperate for vitamin D because it's already sun or cloudy. They already have really, really long winters, really, really short summers. So that if they get any chance of making vitamin D, they have to make as much as possible. So just interesting, right? The Very. Thousands of years, this, the bodies have adapted to where you're at. That's the only reason our, our skin colors are different. My body needed to make as much as possible. Yours was making too much. So weird, right? Just That's weird. Because then I know that um, I, I had a vitamin D deficiency, and I'm like, how? You know, Most African Americans do. I was do. like, how? And they, you know, they think that contributes to a lot of like, my hair loss because like autoimmune and things like that because I didn't have enough vitamin D. So now I make sure that at lunchtime, me and Harriet go outside just to get some sun well, and that was an a, hour. Well, that was one of the things they found out during COVID, too. One of the reasons African Americans were more disproportionately affected was that they almost all had a lower vitamin D status. So it wasn't even necessarily economics and stuff like that, lack of access to health care. It was your immune system is not as functional because you don't have enough of the thing that helps make your immune system go. So weird. That is very weird. And the, the vitamin D is also strange. Is even though it's a vitamin, it acts way more like a hormone because it's fat soluble, but it also bounces between different organs and systems, doing different jobs all over the place. So yeah, again, the machine we live in is very complicated. That's what these podcasts pretty much always come back to. We want to make it very simple, complicated. but they're not simple. Because <laughs> that makes so much sense about I think what contributed to my hair loss because. They told me then, you know, I had very low vitamin D, and I was just like, I was in band. I was in things. I thought like I was in the sun, make barbecue, and so, you know, that is something I know I had a cool, I had a question about, because, you know, obviously, if you haven't met me here in the office, I am African-American, and I have a bald head. And she rocks it, guys. <laughs> and I rock she, it. She looks great. I rock don't it. Don't let her, don't let her fool you. <laughs> well, 
Let's see. I think we have wrapped up all our questions. And if you have any more questions, we would love to do a part three. These are very fun. And it's very uh, cool to like see what y'all have questions about. What y'all think about. You know, I agree with you too. Because I, I, I just like using the, instead of me and Dallas coming up with topics, I like just answering y'all out of the horse's mouth, right? That's what I'd rather do. Is yes. You tell me what you're looking for. I can help at least guide you and get you as close to it as I possibly can. So yeah, we'll like I said, maybe in another three or four months, maybe even six months, we'll, we'll slowly build up our catalog again and do another one of these. Because again, it's just easy to get in directly and talk a little bit about a lot of subjects instead of just a huge deep dive into one specific subject. That is true. And also don't forget, we are in our giveaway for the month of July. Um, share our podcast, like our podcast, and that will get you into an entry to win a free gnarly hydrate, which has all your B vitamins, all your essential things you need for this hot summer weather. Don't forget, share this. People need to hear this. People have the same questions that you have. They might not have anybody to answer them for them. And so you can do them a great deal of service by sharing this wealth of knowledge that we're giving here freely um, to you. So thank you for all that y'all do. We appreciate our clients. (laughs) Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see y'all next week. Bye.